Hello everyone and welcome back to another industry report. Before we get into it, if you missed last night's video regarding Anthem, be sure to check it out. It just went up a little bit late. Now, today we're talking about Bungie and Destiny. The last time we left off, the news had just broken that Bungie had broken its ties with Activision and now had full control over the future of the Destiny franchise all on the backdrop of the studio having received a $100 million round of funding with NetEase in the summer of 2018. And this all left us with questions. What was the price of this freedom? What would the future of Destiny look like? And just how much of the bad was down to Activision and how much was down to Bungie. Well, we now know a hell of a lot more with the next season of Destiny content launching with Bungie, even in their marketing, touting their enhanced freedom. We're starting to figure out what the roadmap for a Bungie-controlled Destiny looks like. So first up, what was the price of this freedom? Cash. A whole lot of cash. Activision Blizzard reported revenue of 164 million and operating income of 91 million as a result of the termination of their publishing agreement with Bungie. That means that Bungie paid in cash up to $164 million to get full control of the franchise. Might seem a bit insane, but of course, remember, they got a big cash injection with that NetEase round of funding that got them $100 million. And there's also the fact that ultimately, Bungie are more tailored and more focused towards Destiny 2 and their other projects. Activision Blizzard or not, they are a larger organization who incur a far greater overhead, who clearly grew their staff count rather irresponsibly. What is acceptable revenue for Bungie is probably not going to be acceptable for the lumbering, bloated Activision Blizzard, meaning that basically buying out that cash flow of Destiny 2 and the future control of the franchise is probably a sensible thing for Bungie to do. Now, what I think this does show us is a desire to continue the franchise. They could have just kept taking along with Activision and not put down the money for this deal and then just shifted over to whatever NetEase um, wanted them to do, whatever they hopped in to fund. Well, with this move, we quite clearly see a full commitment to the Destiny franchise. And that makes us wonder, what will Destiny look like under the full control of Bungie? It's very hard to say but it could be something rather different because much of the DLC release schedule of Destiny 1 and Destiny 2 was dictated by the publishing agreement between Bungie and Activision. So it's quite fair to say that the franchise's expensive DLC practices really hurt their growth, especially um, late, you know, late in the game where the cost of entry was high and customers who had been burnt multiple times really did not feel like it was okay to go back into the game. The only other major loot shooter to be completely controlled by its developer is actually Warframe. Bioware's Anthem is owned by EA. Massive Games' division is owned by Ubisoft. Certainly, Bungie are going to have more freedom in how they move forward. Personally, I'm very keen to see what Destiny 2 Year 3 looks like, as well as Destiny 3. Destiny 2 is, of course, locked into this year of the season pass, as, of course, it was established back in the Activision days. I think we can all agree that, you know, as much as Forsaken may have fixed things up and maybe if Season of the Drifter is great, well, you're looking at an expansion pack and a season pass. And that is just a lot of money, making it financially very hard for launch players to get back into the newest content. Will Year 3 of D2 be free with a microtransaction focus like Warframe? It's hard to tell, but right now, Destiny absolutely is the most expensive loot shooter out there in terms of content, even though I do also think it's probably one of the most polished experiences. We do have some bad news, though, before we get into the good news with Season of the Drifter. Well, potentially bad. You see, the first iteration of the Eververse store since Bungie's Freedom has came out. And you know what? It's a bit strange. Previously, they had the Prismatic Matrix. Basically, every week, 10 items would appear in the Prismatic Matrix pool. You'd get one of them, uh, well, you get one token per week, and you could use that to get one of them at random. If you didn't use your token, it would be stored up, and you could pull up to three tokens by just waiting three weeks. Of course, you had the ability to purchase more tokens for 200 silver each, and that's about $2 each. This system is being removed with the upcoming season of The Drifter, now being replaced with a new system that has particularly interesting pros and cons. So each week, there's going to be a new Eververse bundle. Of course, Eververse is just the name of their cash shop, and it will be purchasable for silver only, and silver is the premium currency. Now, these are going to contain, like, guaranteed items. You'll know what you're getting up front, and they will include a bundle-exclusive vanity item, and that's it. 
There's no free component. Now this has sparked off outrage and I totally understand why. There are now cosmetics that you have zero chance of getting through gameplay. That feels terrible. It feels like a straight up money grab. And I mostly do agree. I think it sucks. However, while it does suck, it might be slightly less evil than the previous system. Why do I say that? Well, randomness. The Prismatic Matrix was a variable reward system. Much like how a casino would give you some free chips as a bonus, they gave you a free roll to get you hooked every week. Of course, completely knowing that the chances were that you would not get the thing that you wanted from your free roll, but that you had, because there be of there being no duplicates, you would have increased the chance of your next roll being the thing you wanted from that week's Prismatic Matrix, which of course would be gone after that week. That further incentivizes the next token purchase. So the design of the old system feels far, far closer to gambling, being designed to really play into compulsive fear of missing out behavior. So sure, they, you know, the freebie doesn't really feel, not getting the freebie doesn't really feel good, but they weren't giving that freebie to people out of the goodness of their hearts. So the new system gives you less stuff, but it's also less evil. I suspect the Bungie might actually make less money because of this being less emotionally manipulative but that they also have managed to take off players by there being no freebie. Basically, it's a bit of a lose-lose. Fundamentally, though, it shows the character progression visually is at the core of a game like this. Unlike Warframe, Destiny 2 has an upfront price, an expansion pack price, and a yearly season pass. The Eververse store then gives you things that would really be free in most games and were mostly free in Destiny 1. It takes away from the mastery loot, but takes away from the potential for in-game loot to be fun. The Eververse store continues to be an absolute black mark on Destiny 2. Oh boy, well, now that I've unhyped you all, let's talk about the new season of content. After all, Bungie seemed to be quite excited about it and how their newfound freedom could uh, let them do a lot more stuff. Okay, so the season of The Drifter. It is focused on this character called The Drifter, who is currently the person who runs the Forsaken, um, Forsaken's game mode Gambit, which is a PvEVP game mode where two teams of players race to kill enemies, but with the ability to kind of invade the other team's version of the map and kill their players. It's a really cool game mode that personally I've enjoyed a lot. So this Drifter guy has arrived in his big ship and he's dragging a big ball of ice behind him. The season adds a new version of Gambit called Gambit Prime. It only has one round, but it comes with a bunch of new mechanics, such as being able to drain the resources that the opposing team have gathered, as well as new mechanics for the big boss at the end called the Prime Evil that can be summoned in, and these new mechanics are supposed to make them feel a little bit more like raid bosses. Plus, there's also the interesting new effects of the new Gambit-themed gear sets. Now, these gear sets have perks that are themed around the various different Gambit playstyles, which they're calling Reaper, so the people who kill PvE enemies, the Collector, who is the person who goes around collecting the moats that enemies drop, the Sentry, who is focused on killing large enemies like the Primeval, and the Invader, who is the person who is invading the enemy team's match to try to kill their players and drain their moats. When you complete your first Gambit Prime, though, you'll be able to do Reckoning. Reckoning is a new PvE game type that takes place inside of the big ball of ice that the Drifter is seemingly towing about the place. Now, there are multiple tiers of Reckoning, and it is designed to be very fast-paced, very chaotic, a bit like the Crota Raid from Destiny 1, they say, and is the source for the new role-themed and sort of color-coordinated uh, Gambit gear. So that's the core of the new content. Past that, though, there are bounties that are themed around the Drifter working with the Nine. There's a weekly quest where you get to choose um, your side between the Vanguard or the Drifter, with you being able to play both sides if you have multiple different characters. Then past that, there is a new catch-up system called Power Surge Bounties. They're just bounties like you'd expect. They're pretty simple, and they'll get you fully kitted out with item level 640 gear within an hour or two. But of course, you know, that's just a starter kit. Uh, it's not going to take away from the process of actually hunting down the various legendaries and exotics that you're actually going to want to be using at endgame. Uh, there is more, though. Like, there's the return of Iron Banner for everyone. There's a new seasonal event. There's a bunch of new weapons, a bunch of new armor, including um, Strike and uh, Crucible-themed armor. As somebody who really enjoys Gambit, this is right up my alley. But for players who don't enjoy Gambit... Well, this likely, this could be a bit underwhelming, I suppose. Now, when you look forward to the, rest, uh, to the rest of the roadmap, well, it seems like the summer season of content will be a lot better for the non-Gambit uh, players. 
Very much though, this does seem like a good step in terms of content and in terms of systems, with the developers rather interestingly acknowledging that players really did not appreciate the heavy time gating of the previous Black Armory season of content that happened over most of the winter. Now, that summer season really does have the chance to prove itself. It's a lot further away from the Activision Bungie split. All we really know though is that there's a bunch of new stuff, including a new raid and a new type of match made six player gameplay, and that certainly is something that could be positive. Now, what's interesting to me is the way that they ended their video. It really reinforced how having complete control over Destiny would let them build a better game that is more tailored towards its community, a game that's a bit more nimble, a bit more agile. Hopefully that is the case, but at the end of the day, well, we need to wait and see before we throw money at them. That really is my end take, given how much money it's possible to throw into this franchise. So, thank you very much for watching this video. If you would like to watch more on this channel, I recommend my video yesterday on Anthem sales, and it's really about a whole lot more than that, giving you a look in at physical sales from a publisher's perspective, the shifting market, as well as how UK physical sales are a little bit wild right now. So, check that out, and with that, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.